welcome folks to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, today, we're going to begin with a complete diversion from the program of the day. Uh, this October, the remaking of the Titanic is coming to the University of Michigan campus. Uh, uh, artist Claudia Bitrin, who's been making a shot-for-shot -shot recreation of the film Titanic, uh, is going to be here. And students, stamp students in the wearable art class, dressing up and dressing down, are collaborating on this project along with the University of Michigan Synchronized Swim Club to uh, remake the scene of sinking the Titanic. And so I have here a couple of students to tell you a little bit more about this project and a special way that you can support the project. So uh, here to tell you about this, two stamp students, Jilly Arrington and Adam Van Osdell are going to take a moment of your time. So not only can you come and watch us perform in the swimming pool, in this live remake of the Titanic, but you can also bid on this signed football by Jim Harbaugh himself. And the, all the supports go to our class for buying materials, videographers, and making this, isn't this fabulous? Can I get a round of applause for this boat, people? So take out your phones really briefly, take a picture of this, send it to your friends, family, who you think would love a signed football by Jim Harbaugh himself, people. A once in a lifetime opportunity here. Thank you for your time and we will see you at the sinking of the Titanic. <laughs> okay folks, so you know, generously donated by the University of Michigan Athletics Department. Uh, not often that you see the art and design students working with athletics, so it's a special opportunity. Uh, you, too, can join them and watch the actual filmmaking performance in action. Uh, this will be October the 24th. That's coming up, I believe. Uh, that's at 9 p.m. It'll be at U of M's Canem Natatorium. That's 500 East Hoover, right next to the IM building. So again, you can go and watch the performance or just make a high bid on the football you've got until Friday. Okay, so back, back to the program at hand. Today, we present photographer and producer of the podcast Ear Hustle, Nigel Poor. Uh, and I hope many of you may be aware of this podcast and have already listened to it. If you have not, I believe you will be uh, signed up listeners after today. So a big thank you to our partners for today in making this event possible, the Prison Creative Arts Project, uh, more often referred to as PCAP, and the Institute for the Humanities and Michigan Radio 91.7 FM. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the Prison Creative Arts Project, it, be, uh, it brings those impacted by the criminal justice system and the University of Michigan community into artistic collaboration for mutual learning and growth. Uh, it has been a program of the LSNA Residential College since 1990, uh, where it's grown, grown to include courses, exhibits, publications, arts programming, and events which reach thousands of people each year. Many of you will uh, know the program from the annual Exhibition of Art by Michigan Prisoners, which happens each, each March, the largest exhibition of art by incarcerated artists in the country. A couple of their, yeah, that deserves applause. It's an incredible program, folks, and we're lucky to have it here. Uh, they have a couple of forthcoming programs I want to make you aware of. There's one tomorrow evening. Uh, this is the University of Michigan Chamber Choir is going to perform a new piece by composer Roshan Estahidi. Uh, this is inspired by writings of incarcerated PCAP participants. Uh, the world premiere of this new choral composition will be performed at 8 p.m. tomorrow evening at Hill Auditorium. And at 7.15, there'll be a pre-concert talk with the composer conductor Eugene Rogers and PCAPS director Ashley Lucas. So you can catch that tomorrow. On Saturday, December the 8th, PCAP will be holding uh, an annual art auction fundraiser at 6.30 p.m. at the Michigan League. Uh, this year's auction includes work of art by currently and formerly, formerly incarcerated artists, as well as faculty from the School of Art and Design. 
Uh, so join them. There'll be wine and desserts even and live music if that's not enough for you. So that's uh, Saturday, December 8th, a uh, fundraiser for PCAP. We will have our regular Q&A today, not in this theater. Uh, just down the hall uh, near the bathrooms, you'll find the screening room, a smaller theater. So if you want to meet Nigel afterwards and bring your questions, please meet us in the screening room. And on your way out, uh, we have the Voting is Sexy team in the lobby. Uh, you can talk to them after the lecture. They've got some hot info on absentee voting. Uh, and uh, please do remember to silence your cell phones. And now for a proper introduction of our guest, please welcome director of the Prison Creative Arts Project, Ashley Lucas. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much to Christina Hamilton for inviting us at PCAP to co-sponsor this event. All of us at PCAP are delighted to be partnering with the Stamps Lecture Series and the Institute for the Humanities to bring Nigel Poor here. And we feel especially cool because we knew and loved Nigel before she got super famous and before Ear Hustle was even a thing. Nigel Poor is a really interesting character. She is a photographer at Cal State Sacramento and a fascinating visual artist in her own right. She's done quite a lot of her own photography, but she also makes art out of everyday materials, things that other people have discarded, and the quotidian traces of our existence on this earth, like our fingerprints and the lint from our dryers. She has all of the credentials of a professional artist and has exhibited her work in major institutions like the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Cooker and Gallery in Washington, DC, and the Museum of Photographic Arts in San Diego, just to name a few. What's really interesting to me, though, about her work is the ways in which she listens to and retells the story of people who tend to be ignored or voices who are hard to hear. Nigel started going to San Quentin Prison in California in 2011 as part of the Prison University Project. This is a really cool program that takes volunteer professors from universities all over Northern California, and they go inside the walls to offer college courses for credit to the incarcerated men at San Quentin. I hope that the University of Michigan could be that cool someday soon. She taught photography courses at the prison and gained the respect of the staff and the incarcerated men there. She clearly has what one formerly incarcerated PCAP participant refers to as penitentiary credibility, so the folks inside take her seriously. It's like street cred, but not on the street. One of the staff at the prison found a drawer full of negatives of really old photographs taken inside San Quentin from different periods of the long history since the place was built in the late 1800s. Nigel started taking these images and showing them to men who live in the prison right now, asking them what they saw and getting them to tell her stories of their own lives that relate to these historical images. This work grew to, into an exhibition that's opening today at the Milwaukee Art Museum. So if any of you have a chance to get to Milwaukee in the next month or so, I think it would be well worth your while. Nigel visited us here at the U of M about two years ago, along with some experimental musicians. They did this really fascinating performance in the Keene Theater in the residential college where PCAP lives. And it was a musical composition inspired by an essay that an incarcerated student had written in one of Nigel's classes. So she's really good at finding ways to bring all different kinds of art forms together. While she was here, she met with some of my students and went into a men's prison in Jackson, Michigan to participate in a theater workshop. And the students and the men in that workshop just couldn't stop talking about how cool Nigel was and how much they wanted her to come back. So we're really, really happy that she decided to come back to campus now. Today, most of the folks I meet who recognize Nigel's name are fans of her podcast, Ear Hustle. And if you can't see, I am a huge Ear Hustle fan. I highly recommend the t-shirt, it's really soft. Um, <laughs> since May of 2017, when they released their first episode, Nigel and her co-host, Erlon Woods, who is serving time at San Quentin, have been bringing the rest of us stories and music from the yard at the prison. Ear Hustle is unequivocally my favorite podcast. If you have not started listening to it, you are way behind and you need to get with the program quickly, like right after this talk. Uh, one of the things that I love about the, pod the podcast are how endearing and funny and approachable the co-hosts are. Nigel and Erlon have this great rapport and they really bring you into the stories that they're telling from inside the prison. They model the kind of respect that all good programming in prisons should garner between incarcerated folks and those of us who live on this side of the walls. 
It's some of the best reporting about incarcerated people that I've ever heard, because it shows the men in the institution in which they live in all of their complexity. For most of my life, I have been watching people shut down and turn away from meaningful conversations about people in prison. Nigel and the guys she works with at San Quentin and Ear Hustle have got us all listening. And those of us with loved ones inside the walls could not be more grateful. Please welcome me in bringing Nigel Poor to the stage. Hi. Um, thanks, thanks for all being here. I really appreciate it, and I'm really honored to be invited back to Ann Arbor. I think this is my third time here. So to be invited by Penny Stamp and P. Cap and the uh, Institute for Humanities is a real pleasure for me. It's a great community to be part of, even if it's only for the 34 hours that I'm going to be here. So um, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. OK, so I have a lot that I want to talk to you about, but I'm going to stay on track. So I'm just going to dive in right now. I'm going to I'm going to uh, talk about the the art the visual art projects that I do inside San Quentin and also about the podcast. So there is a lot to cover. Um, as Ashley mentioned, I have a show that just opened today at the Milwaukee Art Museum, and it's up until March 2019, which seems like a long time right now. Um, and the name of the show is Nigel Poor and the Men of San Quentin Prison. And I want to I'm going to start with images that I worked on or collaborated on with the men inside when I first started going into San Quentin in 2011 as a volunteer professor, as mentioned, for the Prison University Project. The Prison University Project is the only on-site degree granting program in the California Department of Corrections where men can earn an AA degree. And it's taught by all volunteer professors from, from the uh, Bay Area. And I wanted to teach a history of photography class that, and they had never done that before. It was the first time I had gone into a prison and I was really naive. I thought I could just go in and teach the exact class that I taught at my own university walk in with my computer and not edit the class at all. And I was quickly told by the woman who runs the program, Jody Lewin, who's she's a wonderful person, but she still has to work under some of the, the strict parameters of a prison. And we were told by the um, administration I could teach the class, but I couldn't show any pictures of children, sex, drugs, violence, or complicated emotional imagery, which meant that there wasn't really anything left to show except maybe some landscape work, and that wasn't gonna that wasn't gonna pass for me. So Jody, the director of the program, arranged for me to meet with the warden and the undersecretary of the department and give them a crash course in the history of photography. So I got three hours with them. I showed them all of the work, and at the end of that three hours, they gave me permission to bring in all of the images, and they wanted to take the class. So, <laughs> so what that showed me is that direct conversation, listening to people and being receptive and being able to explain your ideas is the, is the key to making anything happen. And that with some will and by being polite and being open, you can do things that you never thought were quite possible. And that lesson has been um, given to me over and over again, working inside a prison, which is quite difficult. And there's no reason why any of the projects that I do there should ever work, um, but they seem to. And it's because it's a collaboration, and it's because I go in there with respect for the men that are housed there, and also for the people who work there. And I always say that the projects I work on are about the community of San Quentin, and that community obviously includes the incarcerated people, but it does also include the administration and the correctional officers there. So I just want to give a little brief introduction to some of the projects I worked on while teaching, because these are what led into the podcast, which I do now. So the history of photography class did not allow men to use cameras, but I really wanted them to get an idea of what it was like to create something. So one of the assignments that we had was to give them images by well-known artists. Um, this one is by David Hilliard, 
printed it out on 14 by 17 inch paper, and then they were allowed to take the images back to their housing unit. And what we asked them to do was to use the front side to map the image, to write on it, to pull out all of the inner meaning of what was below the surface of that photograph. And then take the mapping and create a narrative about the image and about their experience of the image on the other side. So what you see here is an image that was mapped by Ruben Ramirez um, and the images by the photographer David Hilliard. And what I like about photography and using it as a bridge is that it's a, it's a medium that people are so familiar with. So it's not intimidating. It's a medium that you can insert yourself into and find your own experience. And when, when I listen to people talk about images or I read what they write about it, I always consider it a form of autobiography because I think their interpretation tells me as much about them as it does about the image itself. And this is a really good example. Um, this was an, another mapped image by a student, Marvin. This is an Eggleston photograph. And you can see on the top, he mapped it. And uh, no matter what I told him, he was 100% convinced that this was the gas station near where he grew up. Um, and, and I loved it. He was so passionate about it. And you, if you look at the top, there's um, a door that's open. And he circled it. And it says, figure this out. So there are all these nice clues about how he was trying to understand the image. And then the narrative that he wrote on the other side begins with a very complicated, on the bottom right, family tree, and then kind of blossoms into the story about his family. So a really concrete example of the photograph becoming a vehicle for autobiography. Uh, this is an Emmett Gowan photograph done by Walter, who was obsessed with outer space. Um, he'd been working on a science fiction novel for about five years, which was over a thousand pages long. So, of course, and this is a picture of the desert, but to him it was the surface of Mars. So after he, he mapped it and marked it, he wrote um, a narrative based on outer space. So I, I taught this class for three semesters, and it was it was a really great way to have an introduction to what it's like to work inside an institution like a prison. It gave me enough time to get to know people well, but more importantly, it gave the people inside an opportunity to get to know me and to understand what I was about and what I was interested in. I think a lot of times when people put themselves into a new situation, they tend to go in or they can go in with a lot of hubris and think that the way they do things is the way things should happen. And that, that does not work in a prison. You go in as a visitor, you should go in as an observer and get the lay of the land and figure out how you can be part of an already existing community. So those three semesters um, allowed me to do that. Towards the end of those three semesters, I was talking with Lieutenant Sam Robinson, who's the public information officer there. Um, and I was in his office one day and he showed me this incredible banker's box full of beautiful four by five negatives. This is what you see here and this is the, the kind of center point of the exhibit that's up right now. So these were all taken by correctional officers between about 1930 and about 1987. And if you don't know what a large format camera is, it's the camera where the negatives are four by five inches. You have to go underneath a dark cloth to use the camera. It's incredibly cumbersome. And it's amazing to me that they were using this camera for so many years inside when by the 80s nobody was really using them. So these images were taken to document events. They weren't taken to be seen by the public outside of prison. And I should warn you up front that some of the images are quite disturbing, so please keep that in mind. They document murders and suicides and violence that happens in the prison, but they also document things like weddings and sports events and ice carving sculpture contests and guys playing basketball on donkeys and family visits and things that you just would never imagine happening inside prison. And one of the things that's important to me about this archive is that it documents life inside in all of, his nuance, in all of its nuances and reinforces the important realization that life exists in prison. I think people often have the idea that when someone goes into a prison, their life is over. And it's such a misconception. 
People love, people get educated, people have jobs, people grow and change, and everything that happens on the outside happens inside prison. Um, it happens in a sequestered area, and of course there's sometimes added violence, but one of the things I'm always trying to do in these projects is to talk about the commonality between the inside experience and the outside experience. Um, so there isn't a lot of information about what's happening in these negatives. Sometimes they're inside a little envelope with a date and a brief description that might say murder on the lower yard or wedding. And then I have to try to figure out what's happening in them. So I wanted to show you a selection of some of the images. I put them into 12 different categories that I thought they could fit in, but in some ways these are quite random. So this is the escape and confinement section. Here you can see this is a, a escape dummy that somebody has made in 1963. And when I look at it, what I see is the incredible creativity of somebody to be able to create this mask out of whatever materials they had available to them. It could have been toothpaste and paper, could have been flour and water, I don't know. And then to create the face using actual hair. So although it is on the surface about escape, to me it's about ingenuity. This is a confinement image. This is a typical cell at San Quentin, which is quite small. Um, it was originally made for two people, but excuse me, for one person, but now it's for two people. And if you put your hands out like this, you can touch each wall. And if you lie down on the bunk, there's about two feet before your head would hit the wall behind you. So in there, there's two bunks, a toilet, and a sink, and two men living. This is the escape and confine, uh, excuse me, this is the correctional officer, inmate, and volunteer section. This one's called fight. And here's an image of volunteers. San Quentin is quite different than a lot of other prisons in that it's located in the Bay Area in California, which is a very liberal area. And there's a lot of volunteers that go in and out of the prison, about 3,000 a year. So that means there's a lot of programming inside. So the people there are used to having outsiders come in. There's the college program, which I worked for. There's a Shakespeare group, meditation. There's gardening. There's a new group called San Quentin Cooks, where people are learning to be chefs. So there's just a lot happening there. And I should say that San Quentin began as a maximum security prison, level four prison, and it's now a level two, which means it's medium security. So um, that's one of the things that allows so many people to go in and out of the prison. But it's also the prison where death row is housed in California. So there is a maximum security area with about 700 men on death row. So there's a, a, a difficult dichotomy with inside the walls. Um, this is holidays and ceremonies. There's, um, San Quentin was the first prison in California to have consecrated Native American ground there. And so every month there's a sweat lodge, and, which is quite wonderful when you walk in there. The, the smells of the wood burning is really, really lovely. Wedding ceremony. Education, food, and health is another category. So this is a one-room schoolhouse from 1958, and it was for the children of the people who worked at San Quentin. So a lot of the correctional officers in the administration actually lives on site, so obviously there's children who have been raised there, and they needed to have a school for them. Food. One of the interesting things about looking at photographs when you don't know a lot about them is that you can look at them for clues to, to figure out when they were made and what was happening. So when I look at this one and I look at the food and I look at those olives, I know for sure it's probably you know 1972 because that's when black olives on toothpicks were really popular. <laughs> this is a, just a health. So when I got this archive, I just I spent so much time just going through it and pulling negatives out, never knowing what I was going to find. So it was this incredible treasure trove, um, which I've been working on for about five years now. And originally, I thought I would scan all the negatives, but there's so many, I can't possibly do it. So I'm just keeping up with as many as I possibly can scan and protect, because I think it's an important historic document. And before I took it home, 
they, they were just sitting, you know, in an empty kind of office, moldering away. The next section is a little bit difficult, so just to be warned, um, these are murders and suicides. Um, the, the 4x5 is such a bulky and difficult camera to use, it astounds me that they would have these situations happen and then someone would come in and set up this camera and take a picture. Um, but luckily for us as contemporary viewers, it means that there was a beautiful, large negative to use. So the prints of these are quite vibrant. You can really um, gaze deeply into them, even, which is you know, hard when there's images like this. Um, this is a suicide. This is an area of the prison called Suicide Alley. And when I look at this picture, I really think about the perspective from which it was made. It's looking down um, onto, the, obviously, the, the alley here. And when I look at it, I realize I'm looking at the last thing this person saw before they killed themselves. And so it becomes you know, an incredibly personal image and one that, in some ways, can connect you to the the pain or the chaos that was happening in this person's mind before they, they jumped. This is violence and investigations. And sometimes there are these really absurd pictures like this. This is an investigation, but impossible to know what's being investigated here, right? It seems to be he's measuring empty space. <laughs> This is work and leisure. There's a lot of sports teams at San Quentin. There's baseball, football, tennis. The thing that really blows my mind is that there's a marathon that's run every year inside the prison, which is, I think it's 26.2 miles. Um, and they run around the yard 124 times. So it's not hard enough to run that many miles, but then just to run the same course over and over and over again. Sounds like a kind of torture. This is injury and repair. And then one of the, there's just a couple more um, categories that I put images into, family and visits. There's a very active visiting room at San Quentin, so there's often children that are there. The other thing that I always note in these earlier pictures from the 70s is that during that time, men at San Quentin could wear any clothes that they wanted to wear. And so when you look at a picture like this, it could be anywhere. There's nothing that's prison specific to it. So it could be a Mother's Day celebration in anyone's backyard or a park. Um, this is blood and evidence. Um, this is animals and people, and sometimes the titles are really just so blunt. This one is called Two Inmates and a Seal, <laughs> in case you didn't know what was happening here. So, um, San, sometimes yeah, prisons can be very literal places uh, in, in the way things are described. Um, anyway, there's a part of San Quentin that's a level one prison. It's called, it's like a fire camp. And so some guys actually live outside the walls and they do rescue and firefighting and sometimes they rescue seals. Um, San Francisco is, excuse me, uh, San Quentin is in the bay, right on the water in the Bay Area. So it's uh, actually a strangely beautiful site and a very expensive piece of property. So I imagine developers are always wondering how can they get their hands on the property. Um, this is a doctor with a cat. <laughs> And then this is the last section called the ineffable, and it's for pictures that I just can't figure out at all. So this one's called the mole people, and I look at it, I know that they're wearing um, correctional uniforms. They're very sweaty and dirty. Each of them is carrying a flashlight, and they're in the shower area. So I don't have any answer to what they do, but I imagine that they investigate holes in the prison. I don't know. So. Looking at the 
archive images is fascinating in and of itself, but it's also really important to me that they are expanded and interpreted by people who have a much greater understanding of what the images are about than I have. So like the images I showed you at the beginning where the men were mapping images by well-known artists, I wanted to do the same process with the archive images. And so I got um, a group of men together who were interested in doing that. And we spent a couple years looking at the images. I would bring them in, hand them out. Guys would select the ones they wanted to write about and bring them back to their housing unit, live with them for a couple weeks and map them. So this is Kevin who was part of the process and he's standing in the housing unit um, holding one of the images that he mapped, which happens to be this one. Um, the the um, title that the prison gave it was Caught on Ranch, and Kevin at the bottom notes who's really caught. So around it are just are his interpretations and, ex and explanation of, of what's happening in the image, and these are also part of the exhibit in Milwaukee. This was a Mother's Day celebration. Um, and Shaw interpreted this one. We spent a lot of time looking at it and focusing on the woman in the center who's kind of staring off into the distance and she has one man lying in her lap who looks really happy and another guy holding her shoulders and then the other man who's sitting off to the side. And we kept talking about like, who's, who's she with? Like who is, who is the guy that she's there to visit? And then Shaw finally solved the problem. You can see on the bottom. He wrote, this picture is about free love, um, and he figured it was taken in the 70s, so it didn't matter who she was with. <laughs> um, this, this is just called Jim Profile, but I don't know if you can notice in the picture, he's embroidered on his shorts. It says Big Gaunt. Um, and so I love that kind of little detail that somebody would take these very bland, just white shorts and make them more beautiful by embroidering on them. I can place this image in the 70s because I know there's no uh, weights in, allowed inside the prison anymore, so it had to be when there was still the ability to lift weights inside. And then this is the last image, um, stabbing in the yard. And you can see he's, he's holding a long a long a knife that was made inside the prison. So often the images come in a sequence. There'll be four or five images documenting a particular event that happened, and then sometimes they'll just be an image on their own. So again, it's this kind of beautiful visual mystery to solve that can be, the puzzle that can be kind of pulled apart for us and put back together as the men interpret the images for us. These are just, uh, just a few quick installation images um, of the show going up in Milwaukee. So for the exhibition, I ended up printing them 16 by 20, and at that size, you can really see everything that's happening in the, ne in the negative. And these are just some of the, the books that were inside the box with the negatives. These were carried around by the correctional officers taking notes about their day inside. And so sometimes I can actually find a note that references one of the photographs, but mostly I can't. So again, this archive will ultimately remain, um, remain a mystery. So working on this project got me interested in thinking about other kinds of storytelling, which ultimately led to the podcast Ear Hustle, which is what I want to spend the rest of the time talking about. Um, in 2013, I started working, and I, don't, I would like to start by saying I have no background in doing audio. I'm a photographer, so moving into the world of audio was completely new to me. In 2013, I started working on a radio project with a group of men inside, and we were telling stories that were kind of more journalistic, and they were being aired on a, a local public radio station. And I enjoyed doing it for a while, but after some time, I felt like I wanted to branch off and do something that I thought was more artistic, something that would allow for longer form storytelling, and also allow us to use the incredible music that a lot of the men inside San Quentin produce. So I approached my co-host, Erlon, who you see up here with me. Um, I'd met him working on the radio project, and I asked him if he liked the idea of us trying to come up with a podcast. And he said, that sounds good to me, but what the hell is a podcast? Um, because if you're in prison, you don't always have the ability to, to learn about new technology. So I got permission to bring some um, podcasts in for him to listen to, and he kind of got the idea. 
And um, he said, this is really easy. You just play music and talk. And <laughs> I was like, yeah, maybe not so easy. But so over time, I think he's come to realize how difficult it is. Anyway, we got permission from the prison to start a podcast. And the idea was that we were just going to play it inside the prison on a closed circuit station so the guys inside could hear it. And we started doing that. And then I heard about a contest that uh, Radiotopia was running. They're a podcast network. And they were looking for a new podcast. So I got permission to submit an application for it. And I think the administration said yes, because they thought there was absolutely no way we were going to win. Um, they, there were over 1,500 applications. And after about four months, we found out we were in the top 10. And they still weren't that worried. And then we were in the top four. And then they started to get worried. <laughs> and then eventually we won. And it was. Um, really incredible. I, I, I got the news, uh, so I got to go in and tell Erlan and the other guys that I work with that we won the podcast, and we all realized that it, it was quite an event for us, and that we were going to have a lot to learn, and that it wasn't going to be easy at all. So we were picked up by Radiotopia. Um, we're now in our third season, and to everybody's surprise, it's been quite a success. Um, it's been downloaded over 17 million times, it's played, obviously, across the country and across the world. It's now heard in all of the prisons in California, which are 34 institutions, some other prisons across the country. And for some reason, um, it was picked up in England very quickly in the first season and, and is played in 114 prisons in the United Kingdom. So that feels quite good to us. Um, I want to just show you a little bit of, of where we work. So everything is done inside of the prison. So it's not glamorous. We don't have a very we don't have really easy working conditions, but we do the best we can with what's on offer. When we won the contest, it came with some money, so I was able to buy computers and decent microphones and all kinds of recording equipment. So that's what you see in here, and that's what we work with. So Erlan and I are the co-hosts. And the idea is that it's an outside and an inside person working together as equal professional colleagues, each bringing their talents and understanding um, to the endeavor. I stand in as the voice, obviously, of the outside who can ask questions and can go places that maybe Erlan can't. Erlan is the escort inside and can take us to places that obviously I can't go. Um, we have a really great relationship. He's the best professional colleague I've ever worked with, and so I feel really blessed by that. Um, the idea is to talk about everyday life in prison. We don't talk too much about people's crimes or if their sentence is right or wrong. We do get into that a little bit, but that's not our mandate. Our mandate is to talk about what happens once your life becomes a life that happens behind bars. Um, so we do pitch sessions, and then we decide who we're going to interview. We bring them down into the media lab. And we spend, at first we were probably spending about three months to complete a story. Now we're doing a little bit better. It's probably about six weeks to do a story. Um, since we've been doing it, we've gotten more permission from the administration to go out into the world of prison. So we're able to go out into the yard now without anyone escorting us with our portable recorders and talk to people out in the yard, kind of like man on the street situation. So here I am with Erlan, um, and then in the other picture, that's Antoine, who does the, the music for the podcast. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're not allowed to use any copywritten music, so all of the music and the ambi and sounds that you use are all um, recorded in the prison and then produced inside. We try to use a lot of the actual sounds of the prison, so you'll hear that along with the music. So I'm going to play uh, just a few clips for you. The first one is from an episode called Left Behind. And usually in a story, we'll have one character um, who we call the mule. And he carries the story through the whole episode. And then we break that up with some other stories. And Erlan and I come in and out as narrators to push, to push it forward. So this is about the three strikes law in California. Uh, and, and Curtis Roberts is serving a 25-year to life sentence for um, his last crime was stealing $40 out of a cash register. His first two crimes were also nonviolent thefts. He's been in prison for over 20 years now. So what you'll hear is some yard talk at the beginning with people talking about what happens when they receive these long sentences, and then we'll hear a little bit from Curtis about how he dealt with first coming to prison. E, your story's really different, but you also got a long sentence under the three strikes law. Yeah. 
31 years to life. Right. Do you remember what was going through your mind when you first heard your sentence? What the? That's what was going through my mind. You know, you start to think the worst thoughts, you know. Your mind gets to thinking like, man, this system is racist. It's unjust, you know. I didn't even know I was a three-strike candidate. You're thinking the system is against you. That's what you're thinking, like, oh, they fucking me. Yeah, I don't even know how you can take it in. I'll tell you what. Let's go back to the yard and talk to some other three strikers about this. Do you remember uh, what was going through your mind when you first learned of your sentence? Pain, hurt and pain. I cried. I, I couldn't critically think. I couldn't process anything. I was just overwhelmed for a year and a half later. At first, I, I was in denial. I was thinking, no, there's no way they're going to give me a life sentence at 21. And when the judge slammed the uh, gavel down and said, I'm sentencing you to life in prison, and I was just like, wow, it just totally dumbfounded me. That went blank. Uh, do you remember what was going through your mind when they first sentenced you? Life's over. It don't matter no more. And I quit caring. Life may be over, but here's what may be worse. You still have to keep on living it. And to live in this environment, you got to have some hope that you're going to get through it. It's up to each prisoner to find their own reasons to keep going. Back to Curtis. Well, you know, when I came to prison, um, the goal I set for myself was not to make it out alive. That wasn't the goal. The goal was that I didn't lose myself in the process. And um, I remember when I was going through my reception process at Tehachapi Prison, and the whites came to me and they wanted to put a knife in my hand and told me to go stab a child molester. And they said, you know, you gotta do this. You gotta prove yourself. You know, I didn't come in here stabbing child molesters. I didn't come in here being a gangbanger or a thug. Um, I'm a stupid idiot that stole some money. I'm just not gonna pick up a knife and go stab somebody. And I would rather die than lose my integrity. So uh, for me, one of the, the interesting changes is to move from having been a visual artist for so long to now somebody who works with language and sound and recording. And I, I love the intimacy of listening to people's voices. And I also love how collaborative it is. And doing photography, being in my studio, I spent you know 20 plus years working alone quietly, and I really enjoyed that. But now the podcast only works if it's a group of people coming together. And that's a very refreshing and invigorating way to work when you find the right people that you can bounce ideas off of. So when, when I hear these, um, I always think about the joy of making them and what it's like to find a, a community that you really want to spend time with. And even when the stories are difficult, like this one about three strikes, I still, a, a, a real sense of humanity comes across, I think, in the voices of the people that are talking, and they become real and, and three-dimensional. And I think, you know, that's kind of the goal for everybody in life, right? To become um, a being that's worth being considered and heard. This is um, from an episode we did called Unwritten, about the unwritten race rules in prison. And prison, unfortunately, is a very segregated place, at least in California. So when you go out to the yard, there's the black area, the white area, the Asian area, and the other area. Um, and then there's people like Mesro, who are trying to break the racial lines and doing it in a very interesting way. He's a self-described nerd and he uses his nerd power to get people to, um, to think in, in a more expansive way. Oops. All right, so Erlon, let's talk about one particular space where race has become a little blurry here at San Quentin, as Charlie put it. We mentioned the main racial groups, but there's another group where racial boundaries have softened just a bit. Yep, the L7s, the nerds. What do you mean L7? <laughs> you know, put up an L, put up a seven, put them together, what you got? A square. The squares. I, whoa, okay. <laughs> this is California. Even in prison, there are L7s and nerds. I got a creature card here. Uh, his name is Duskdale Worm. Uh, he's a creature, uh, and he has trample. That's Mesro. He's been in San Quentin for about six years. And as you know, Nigel, he's into fantasy games. What do you have in your hand? Oh, this, this is a deck of uh, magic cards for Magic the Gathering. 
uh, this is a this is a green deck. It's comprised of like forests, uh, and I got a bunch of like terrible worms in here that do all kinds of bad. It's called the Worm Weaver Coil, and what it does is you have to enchant a green creature with it, and it gives the creature a six six, which makes we it gamers we tend to uh, we tend to be the the nerds and the outcasts, and a lot of us are into superheroes and science fiction, and we read books and we spend time in the library. And I've been a nerd my whole life. When you got to prison, how did you find your people? I was walking the track and I seen some guys and they were just kind of hanging out and they had this D&D &D board sitting out. And I was like, oh man, is this Dungeons and Dragons? They were like, yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, I get down with this. Uh, what's up, my name is Mesro. And, uh, but how can I get in? What's going on? We hang out in an area, which is what the hardcore guys, they like to call it a neutral area. Right? It's not an area where it's separated like, oh, this is only where the blacks hang out or this is only where the whites hang out. We don't have that over there. Uh, everybody's welcome to come over there. If they want to come and hang out with the gamers, by all means, come and see us. When I walk down into the yard, when I see your area, who's going to be there? You might see, you know, maybe three, four black guys, two Asians, a couple of Middle Eastern, a couple of white guys, right? We're all over there having fun hamming it up. Somebody might be being the dungeon master like I'm, I usually am, and I'm very active about it, right? I like to make voices and do all kinds of play acting and stuff. And, uh, you know, we're getting our game on. We're enjoying ourselves. Uh, we're not in here, you know, mad dogging with the thousand yard stare, plotting on somebody else or anything. We're just having a good old time. We're staying out of the way. And you never had a problem? No. Because I, I, I've heard really awful stories about guys who cross the racial line here and then Shit happens. Well, I've had people ask me questions. Like, I remember once I was walking past the area that they call the Black Sea. That's that spot that's right by the basketball court. It's called the Black Sea. The Black Sea, yeah, that's what they call it, because that's where all the brothers are at, right? And so when I was walking by, uh, a guy pulled me over. He was like, hey, man, let me talk to you, youngster. What's up? Why you always hang out over there by the rec shack over there? I said, well, because that's a neutral area. That's an area where everybody can be. I don't like being places where people are restricted. And he was like, well, I think you need to come and hang out with us. And I was like, why don't you come and hang out with us and figure out what it's like to be uh, a little bit more free, right? Even though we're in prison and it sucks, but you know, we have a little bit more freedom hanging out with people that we want to hang out with rather than people that we're forced to hang out with. And he was like, oh man, and he, he got a little bit upset about it. And I was like, well, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, it sounds to me like you have some kind of personal weird issue with race or whatever it is, uh, but you need to like get over that. I, I'm glad to hear people laugh because one of the um, things I always want to bring up with this work is that when you work in prison, people expect it to be heavy and depressing, and it's not. There's, there's love, there's humor, there's challenges, and I think that really comes across in the podcast, and there's also just a lot of charm. I'm gonna play one more clip for you, and this is from a story called Looking Out, and this, the main character is a fellow named Roach, who grew up with a, a lot of horrible things happened to him when he was six. His mother tried to drown him, and from there he went to different kinds of foster care. He finally ended up in prison, and he has a hard time with people, but he's a really loving person, and he, he shares that love with, with his critters, what he calls his critters, and he's always taking care of something. He's had mice and rabbits and birds and cockroaches and lizards, anything you can imagine finding on a yard, he'll find and take care of. He fixes broken wings on birds. He usually, when I see him, he has a prey mantis on him, um, and he's a, he brought one time this huge box into the media lab full of snails for me to see which are very, a little unnerving. Anyway, I want to just play this little clip. So it starts out with me asking Erlon if he could be an animal, what kind of animal would he be? And then we go out to the yard and ask guys about what animals they would be if they could be one. And it ends with Roach talking about what kind of animal he would be. And one thing when I listen to this is I, I listen to the reasons of why the people we talk to choose a specific animal. And it says so much about where their, I think where their mind is at that moment. Okay, so here's the last clip. I know we're talking about deprivation, but there are two things that can never be taken away from you in prison, and that's your fantasies and your memories. So I've got a question for you. Since we've been talking about animals, I'm curious. If you could be an animal, what would you be? A beluga whale.
What? <laughs> what? <laughs> wow. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason for it, but it just sounded cool. But we did go to the yard and ask some guys what type of animals would they be? If I could be any animal, I'd be a, a penguin. They're super cute in tuxedos, and they're like the coolest animals ever. And they slap box like crazy, too. I would want to be a panther, and the reason why is I like the, uh, the sleekness of the animal. Dog, because I know that someone would adopt me. A yeah, Galapagos turtle, because they live to be over 150 years old. Lion, because it's king. Marmot, because they're misunderstood. Everybody thinks they're weasels. And they're not. They're marmots. <laughs> I want to be a water bottle, because it's diligent, and because it says very little. It would be an eagle, because they can fly. So that means I would always be free. I would always be safe. Tiger, because tigers love their independence. A jellyfish, because it has no natural enemies. I asked Roach what kind of animal he'd want to be, and his answer is pure Roach. <laughs> I want to hear that. If I could be an animal, any animal, it would be a wish dragon that would only appear when a kid needed it, because my experience with imaginary friends, they were needed. So the thing about being a dragon is they eat meat, and I couldn't do that, so I'd have to be a vegetarian dragon, a thin vegetarian dragon, because I would spend a lot of time looking for food. That's a lot of carrots, that's a lot of apples, uh, oranges, that's just a lot of vegetables. Who's gonna um, grow those vegetables for a giant dragon? Unless I'm a baby, a, a tiny dragon, then I just eat little slices of cheese. I didn't think about that. I've heard that clip so many times and it makes me laugh every single time. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up in two minutes. So I'm gonna move forward, but I, I just wanna mention, mention this briefly that part about doing this podcast is about connecting. And part of that is connecting with the people who listen. And I've come to realize that for me, artwork succeeds when it starts a conversation. It doesn't matter how many people are involved in that conversation, it could just be one other person. But the conversation that this has started with our listeners has been super gratifying. And we hear a lot from them. We get photographs, we get letters mailed to us, we get lots of emails. And these are just some pictures of our listeners. So um, Anna, who drives her 18-wheeler across the country, um, uh, Cleo, who was Erlon's former cellmate. We have somebody from the Arctic, Switzerland, a, a couple other formerly incarcerated people, a guy who listens on his way to the gym in Kuwait, um, Hope in South Africa, and Danny listens while he collects the garbage. And I just love the breadth of, of the listeners. Um, these are just, I'm gonna go past these because I wanna talk about one last thing that I think is really important about making artwork. I think the best artwork encourages people to go back to their studios or, or go back to their homes and make something themselves because they feel inspired by what they've seen and what they've heard. And I see that in the postcards, the handmade postcards that we get from people. So there's one of Roach on the bottom corner and that's supposed to be me and Erlon, but I'm not sure that works. Um, <laughs> and this is an incredible um, quilt that someone made for us. This is a great illustration that somebody sent us. And then we do have t-shirts, and I just, um, this, uh, this guy sent us a t-shirt, and I just want to read, uh, we, excuse me, he sent us this email, and I just want to read what he wrote. Um, I received my Ear Hustle t-shirt today in the mail, and I scrambled into it and took off to an appointment in Hollywood. While I was waiting at the coffee house, a guy came right up to me and started talking about the podcast. He was in his 20s and I'm in my 60s, and I had to snap a picture and send it off to you because I've never worn a t-shirt before that started a conversation and made me a new friend. And I was like, that's, that's great. And to me, that's what Ear Hustle is about. It's about trying to connect with people. And I'm gonna end with this last picture because I just got this today, literally about two hours before this lecture, maybe three hours. Um, <laughs> so I truly never expected your household to end up on somebody's nail, but, <laughs> but it's fantastic. So I could talk to you for much longer, but I'm gonna respect the clock and thank you so much.
And if you're interested, there'll be Q&A in the, the screening room. I look forward to seeing any of you who are interested there.